All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another great presentation during ISU Open Education Week. My name is Kim Miller, and I am a health sciences librarian here at ISU in Meridian, and I'm also a member of the Open and Affordable Education Resource Committee. And I am excited to be hosting today's session with Dr. Rob Leone. Uh, Dr. Leone is an Associate Professor of Human Resource Development and the Program Lead for the Bachelor of Science in Workplace Training and Leadership and the Master of Science in Human Resource Development. Rob has been recognized for his teaching and research, which focuses on evidence-based leadership practices and motivational frameworks to drive workplace and personal fulfillment. His research has been published in a variety of academic journals, including Performance Improvement Quarterly, Journal of Organizational Psychology, Human Resource Research, and Advances in Developing Human Resources. Dr. Leone is also one of our 2022 textbook heroes. So um, with that, please take it away. Terrific. Thank you. So I understand I have uh, 20 minutes or so to share what I've done, and then uh, we have some time for some questions at the end. So a little background. Um, so our graduate program in human resource development really aims to prepare practitioners for industry. So very few of our students go on to advance doctoral studies. And I think that's important as I present what I'm about to talk about because we use different tools and different frameworks that um, scaffold straight into the workplace a little bit different than a more intensive framework of research and theory building. Um, our students are 100% asynchronous um, and we're 30 credit master's program. And over the last couple of years, we've been having conversations about how do we better serve our students and their busy work lives. Um, and what we arrived at is that we need to revisit what works best with their schedule. And one of the things to do that was to move many of our 16 week courses into eight week courses, which that in and of itself creates some new challenges as well of opportunities. But we were having that conversation before I really was paying attention to the OER stuff at the university. And um, so I'd already been trying to figure out how do I take this course that I, I, I adjusted here and chop it down to six to eight weeks um, and still meet our learning objectives. And so I'm going to advance my slide. Um, let's see. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we were looking at. So the 6661 is a, it's called performance improvement. And the emphasis in that course is helping organizations diagnose issues at really a root cause level, not symptomatic level. And so really digging in and, and doing deep dive with organizations to determine what the contributing factors are, right? So oftentimes when we talk to organizations or even leaders in and of themselves, um, we say, you know, what are your pain points or your hangups? And many times they settle in at the symptom level and trying to articulate what their problems are. And then they try to identify solutions at that symptom level. And unfortunately, that only addresses the symptom. And so we see recurrence of problems moving forward. So what this course was designed as it was designed as very much like a consulting client-based course. So the first item is a significant client reliance, and that's very true. So every student or every team had to identify a client to work with to address some real life organizational issues. And, um, and that's time intensive just to even identify those clients, let alone get them on board to essentially open up their organization to give us the access we need to really do those deep dives that we need. Um, at that time, when it was a 16-week course, we had three textbooks going, um, two um, kind of uh, theory and practice books, and then more of a, and then a writing book to assist with the writing because our projects were extremely writing intensive. So they would go in, they'd do the investigation, and I had people pulling in artifacts from all over as part of their analysis. So I had stuff from the state police. Let's use them as an example. And that student's final project was 258 pages long. So it was really immersive for him. But the next student down the, uh, let's say, the roster, they didn't have the same access to the client. They didn't have the same access to the detail. So their final project was in the neighborhood of 70 pages. 
And so that writing book was intended to help them um, strengthen their writing skill as one of our programmatic outcomes. So as the challenges indicate, the first one, clients uh, restricted the access to the information. So when you're working with that, that client, um, and you're really at the mercy of their timetable, as well as how much they want to share. And one of the challenges with our course is that it goes deeper than most leaders understand. And it often reveals items that are a little bit um, touchy for them. And so what we found is that we've had leaders pulling back their sharing and, and, and limiting our students access to the data sources. So that was creating a challenge in and of itself to the, to the class. So its effectiveness was not being um, as high as I'd like it to be. Um, and then because of that, it wasn't really truly like a consulting experience. It was very much a quasi consulting experience where we had to embellish at certain points when we didn't have life um, pan out the way we had hoped with, with respect to the client. And then the other challenge with this was that it was a significant work volume, right? So I mentioned 258 pages for that one student. That's a significant undertaking. Um, but if they want to roll up their sleeves and dive in at that level, I'm here to help and support them. So at the end of the semester, the feedback for that course was actually really positive, um, unless someone really hated the, the workload. So, uh, but what it really did um, unintentionally is it cultivated a level of um, fulfillment within students that they didn't realize they were able to do as much uh, of that work as they thought they could, and they really dove into it. The other challenge um, was that as it related to the, the workload, most of our students would typically take two courses a semester, had to scale back to one course a semester, or one course during this particular semester, and that was in order to handle the workload. So that 16 week model wasn't ideal for us. And so as I started to consider how would I make this work as an eight week class, because we still have to get the, the amount of information, those, those touch points in the 120 hours of Carnegie units, um, how would I do this? And so what it became clear to me is that I had to have a major shift on how I approach this. And this is what brought me into the, the open education resources arena. So. Um, we eliminated the reliance on the client because ultimately it was complicating things. And what I determined was by eliminating that, we didn't really lose a whole lot because it wasn't living up to the expectation that we had had hoped for it to be. Um, we went down to one primary um, uh, reader. And then what we did was to replace the clients we actually brought in a series of case studies, which we wrote with our students. So actually it occurred um, in the semesters prior to, I always gave my students the opportunity to um, publish their papers, uh, publish their projects as a case, a peer reviewed case study, and that I would help mentor them through that. And so we had five of them published that way. And as I started to do that, I started to realize, look, this is our solution to eliminate that client and you do case-based work over these eight weeks, which really streamlined the process. And so we were able to kind of have a couple wins there. Um, just jumping ahead to the enhancement part, student publishing, like our, our grad students were now publishing in a really practitioner oriented program. We'd have uh, grad students publish very few and far between. And it gave us an opportunity to help them kind of further their desires and ambitions as it relates to getting published. So that was a real benefit for the shift. And then that benefit explicitly was our course material moving forward. And so we have a couple more that are being um, built right now for hopefully the next round of submissions and reviews so that we can add it into the course. And so what we did with those cases is that we actually eliminated the client, as we mentioned, and we present all of the cases up front to them where in week one, they would typically have client selection. This way they choose the case and that, that case becomes their client. You know, one of them is focused on a nonprofit. One of them is focused on a, a small business uh, pest abatement company. Um, um, food and beverage industry, we have one in. Um, pharmacy, we have one in. Managing um, a pharmacy, things like that. And so, 
we have a nice little spread of, of topics in terms of cases. So our students self-select the case they want to follow for the entire semester. So the challenge for this course really came down to um, it wasn't as writing intensive as our previous one. So that's causing us to revisit some of our approaches on how um, we were going to strengthen those writing pieces that we're losing from the previous course. Um, and the, the we had to make a, a shift or I had to make a shift because I had a heavy reliance on the textbook and its materials to help teach the information that I, I found myself spending much more time doing one on one coaching with my students, as well as um, as well as videos and supplemental materials that I've created that actually add a personal touch. So, I'm, I, you know, it's not really a loss. It's just a shift. It's different. Um, but one of the things that did occur is that because we went to one book and we streamlined the writing process, we used many more tools and diagnostic tools and models that the book presented. And so in the past, we didn't use the, the tools as much um, in the prior course. We, we used more of the models and then let students develop their frameworks and they can use the tools that they wanted. But in order to expedite the process and keep people moving in the same direction, we centralized that part. And so we really pulled the tools out of the out of the 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 book and used that as the process. And then and the process has six significant steps to it. And so each step has a, a battery of tools that the student can use. And it very is designed in a way that they would be a consultant, right? Our, our, we know that our consultants aren't writing academic papers. Um, so that was more of an academic exercise in the 16 week course. Um, our consultants are writing matter of fact to the point pieces and those tools really help them do that. So as much as that was a shift and a loss in terms of writing intensity, uh, I'm really pleased because it put a better set of tools the tools existed, but they didn't integrate them as much. And now they're using them for the entire project to guide their process. And so that end project is, is, is really nice. And they walk away with this feeling that they've actually accomplished something, um, even though it was a case study. Anything else to add as I think about this? I, you know, I'd, I'd open it up for questions, Kim, because I think this is just a high level overview. Well, I guess what I would add is um, we were able to, what also helped was one, we were able to track down a journal to publish these cases in that was actually open access. So that was a nice addition um, because sometimes, you know, we run into the copyright thing or, especially with case studies, there's some limits in certain journals in terms of approvals and processes to disclose information. And so it took a while to find a journal that would work for us, but it's been a good source for us for this course. That's really interesting. Yeah, I was wondering as you were speaking um, specifically about student choice of publication. Did you have a chance to talk with them about the difference of publishing their work OER versus going the more traditional publishing route um, for their own work? No, it really, well, it was more of a coincidence that it was a, a more conducive route to go through the OER journals. And so, um, once I realized that, because I've published in other um, case journals before, and some of them have like conference requirements to them and, 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 and just barriers that are just, they're not going to allow us to get these created and get them out and put them to use as quickly as we'd like. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Dr. Leon? Go ahead. Um, I think we're having a little bit of hard time hearing you. Do you want to try typing your question in the chat, maybe? Thanks, John. It's not coming through. Sorry about that.
while John types that, anyone else have? Oh, I see. All right, so I'm going to read this from the chat just for the recording. Did you have a good enough experience you think you'd ever give? Sorry, did you have a good enough experience you think you'd ever go to creating your own reader as opposed to using one from a publisher? Oh, in terms, John, now type one, if you mean the textbook, type two, if you mean eliminating the cases. Okay. Uh, gosh, I'm, you know, I'm such a proponent for if people are doing timely, accurate information, um, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And, and so there, this, this book was in its, um, I think third edition and I've kind of grown up with the authors. And so it, it's really solid. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. It's funny you should ask this though, because I was thinking of number two, actually, that as we continue to build these, and, and, and the challenge is, is they're, they're, they're trickling in, right? I, I'm, I'm creating these opportunities with students as a way to support their interests. It's not something that I'm going to, to try to accomplish. But now we're starting to create some critical mass in terms of ideas and concepts here. And so it, it presents itself the opportunity for us to look at potentially developing our own case reader. Because I can tell you, I reviewed a lot of cases um, in closed access journal cases, but also case books, right? We see lots of case study books out there, but they don't, all the books I've seen are presenting it in a way that I want it to lay out the information and, and provide some inquiry and curiosity, um, cultivate those things with the students. So they weren't hitting the marks that I wanted them to be at, but I could see us doing this moving forward. So a little update is that the next time I have an elective offering opportunity, um, my intention is to go ahead and go back to a 16 week course where students will sign up with a real direct client working experience. So kind of like what we started originally, but I think we'll have a smaller group of students we will be able to work much more effectively as teams as a cohort. And I can help improve the quality of some of those client leads as opposed to relying on them to identify them. I can work with my networks here in the community and, and throughout the US to identify those to help kind of cultivate that form to improve that experience. And that's where I see the opportunity for us to really um, go ahead and end with an actual course reader that's developed by the student as a series of uh, case studies. Thank you, sir. We've got one more question in the chat from Spencer. What advice or tips would you give to anyone who is interested in using OER in their course for the first time? Um, I think the, 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 you know, the biggest, the biggest time consuming component to it is the shopping around of it, right? Trying to find what tool is going to adequately cover what I needed to essentially cover. I'll tell you something else I've done over the years, and I haven't done it recently, but I've always made it a priority to try to keep um, book costs down. And, and in some of my classes before, I would actually, I know the bookstore doesn't want to hear this, but I would go and find one or two editions back, so such as research methods. I might have a central book that I want them to use that relates to inquiry, but it's not as much methodology. And then I would say, go find Cresswell's fourth edition on the Libris for 99 cents, as opposed to buying the current edition for $126, right? Because for my students' purposes, they don't need, well, you know, it's what the updates are relative, right? Over, over a 10 year period in terms of a lot of the basic research methodology. So they don't need that whole a lot of depth and detail. So we use, it's not an open access, but it's a, it's a bargain book that, you know, was essentially appropriate a couple of years ago. But yeah, going back to Spencer's question, it's the shopping around piece, it's finding the piece. Um, one of the things, and John knows this because he's my department chair, one of the, one of the obstacles for what I've done with this is that 
as you find out, some OER outlets require publishing fees to help make them open access. And so um, once we get that journal done, uh, you know, I, I try to I try to see if we have funds available or professional development funds to do that. Because I think it really, it, you know, and I, and I don't know what the conversation is at the university, but that might be another angle to help cultivate that within the university is, is having resources available to help offset those as they present themselves so that students can be have a part of that experience or so that the faculty can bring these pieces in. Great, thank you. Other questions? I have one more question. What was your favorite part of this project and working on this course, transitioning it, it looks like, to a different schedule, um, working on the OER? What was what was your favorite part of this project? I would say the favorite part was the student feedback come, come the end, because I think uh, we're in the third semester, second semester now of doing third. So I essentially piloted this before we started having these OER conversations. And then last semester was, I guess, the first legitimate run. Um, and then this semester we're doing it. And the, the greatest satisfaction was the student feedback at the end, right? Because it was such a departure to what we had done before that. It, it, it was such a change that I wondered, what did I not cover? What did I not include? Is this subject deep enough? Do I need to add more content? Um, I, I rely on a real constructivist approach to learning. So I put a lot out there in terms of um, materials and resources, but I really entrusted into the student to dive in and make sense out of a lot of it with a lot of direct coaching. So weekly, I'm touching it. I'm touching base with students for one on one coaching as it relates to project progression. But still, it's 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 that ambiguous or uncertainty of making the significant shift and wondering if it would hold up. I think of it if I built my own cabin by my own hands, is it going to make it through the winter type of thing? Right. Like, did I put enough bones into this project? to make it not only hit our not only hit our learning objectives but have it enjoyable and that they actually feel like they say now wow oh, i can't believe i accomplished this i feel like i can do this for another group now that's great any other questions the other thing i would add is that and I think I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the academic timetable schedule flows at a different pace than the work world. And in some instances, it is faster. In some instances, it's not faster. And, and that was just a factor that we had to work through as a, as a variable in this. So while I'd like to say you get to choose whatever organization you want, like we did in the 16-week model, it just it, it wasn't conducive enough. So when we start to wrap up the course, we start pulling out examples in their life where they now see how this could be put to use in whether it's an example of them working with their current company, company they, they volunteer or like a, a church group or something they volunteer for or even, you know, what tools and elements and models in this class apply to your own personal life. Great. Spencer, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, I think so. I, I was just wanting to be clear. Um, it, it sounds like you're you're also talking about uh, open access in the journals, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are open access journals, as we know, that anyone in the world can read them and you don't have to pay for a subscription. It's free for the reader, right? Yes. But, but you've encountered, I guess, uh, where some of those open access journals, they are asking for an article processing fee or something, right? Yes. And and so, yeah, wouldn't that be nice if if the university could help uh, support that? And I think at some of the um, more well-to-do universities, they they do have uh, funding for that. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that we have that I know of. And I think in some cases, um, libraries have been involved with that in the sense that. 
um, maybe they decide to cut some of the traditional uh, publisher subscriptions, right? And then they use that money to support open access and, and the authors who publish and things like that. So, I mean, I, I think there are lots of models out there that could work, but, but I, I'm, I'm interested to hear that that's something that you want and something that could benefit you and the students as well, because it sounds like it could. Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly what I was uh, trying to get to there. But I, I'm so appreciative that the university has this initiative, and I'm so appreciative that the state's gone down this path, because it is, you know, sometimes things just have to be expensive. Like, there's there's no way around it. Sometimes, by design, there's certain things that we just, you know, you have to pay for higher education. It can't be free for everyone, right? And, and then there's some variability in terms of sticker price. But, you know, to see that us, that we're having these conversations now at, at the state level, at the institution level, we have a, a special group that's dedicated to this. Like, I love it. I think it's a great concept. And so, and, and the success of this initiative is only going to be get more, um, you know, hopefully outcomes and, and opportunities as it relates to this. And so exactly what you mentioned, Spencer, um, maybe one day down the road, someone's going to say, yeah, that's, we're ready to diversify this now. And and direct students in this particular direction or faculty in this, or at least create that opportunity for them to engage in that if that's what they want. Great, thank you for those, um, those ideas. Thank Any you. other questions? While you all are thinking, I'm going to put a link to the full schedule of all of our Open Education Week presentations in the chat. We do have one more, I believe, tomorrow. So hopefully you will make that. And then we will be posting the recordings for all of the sessions here as well. So you can catch up on anything that you may have missed. Terrific. Thanks, Kim. But thank you very much, um, Dr. Leon, for sharing your project with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Wonderful. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Happy to chat further. Thank you.